Coast Authority to order. Um, I'd like to thank the Nashville Sounds for hosting us this morning, and we welcome the opportunity to hear from you later in the meeting. We're also happy to have Councilman Withers with us. He is back with us this morning. Good morning. Uh, and Laura Womack from the Fairgrounds Board. We're happy to have you with us. And we're extremely happy to have our own Anna Page back serving as director this morning. Welcome back, Anna. We missed you. Um, you should have the minutes uh, from the April 4th meeting behind tab number one. I'll give you a moment to review those. Hopefully you've taken the time, but if not. Motion for approval. There a second? Second. Okay, it's been moved and properly second. Any discussion? If not, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposers, nay. The motion passes. Now we will hear from our executive director, Monica Bogneson. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. We have a full house, everybody. Um, you have the agenda before you. We've got a lot to cover today. Several actions that are several agenda items that will require action by the board. Um, it's probably worth noting that a couple of these items would typically have come before the finance committee um, as recommendations. As you know, we canceled the finance committee meeting this morning. We didn't have a Forum, but the items are time sensitive, so we, we need to go ahead and move this through. Uh, are there any questions about the agenda? I'd like to congratulate Fairgrounds and Geodis Park on another award, this time for winning the 2023 Urban Land Institute Nashville Excellence in Development Award. So, congratulations. congratulations. Been quite an award season around here for the <laughs> awards. I think just for every meeting. Yeah. And then lastly, we want to congratulate board member Aaron McGee and his family who just welcomed a, a baby boy. Jovi Aaron McGee was born yesterday, and they're doing well. So we're excited for them, and he gets his <laughs> keep. Are there any questions? If not, that thank you, Monica. So at this time, we're going to invite Deputy Law Director Tom Cross and Jeff Oldham, Metro's Bond Council from the Asperian Sims. They are back with us again this morning to give us an update and walk us through the amendments uh, the Metro Council adopted several weeks ago. So with the authority, which the authority needs to approve. So if you all would. Thank you. Is, is this on? Yes. Um, so... This also, that was housekeeping. This is housekeeping uh, too. And so since April 4th, when this body approved the transaction documents, uh, the Metro Council uh, also approved those documents with a handful of amendments. And so we thought it was appropriate to come back to this board with those amendments and, and have you affirm your approval in, in light of those amendments. And so what you have in front of you is a very simple resolution that says just that and attached to the back of it are the amendments that the Metro Council um, adopted when they adopted the ordinance. And, I, and I'm happy to walk through them. Um, there, there are just a few. Um, Jeff, so, if you don't mind, these sure. are found behind tab three in your document. And, and so just, I guess, part lazy, part easy. Um, I, I just included all the amendments. So the first one, I'm not going to spend much time on it because it is superseded by some subsequent amendments. So ignore it. Um, the second one is an amendment to the lease to make clear that the team's obligation to fund operating and capital expenses would not be adversely impacted if the state were to pull back on any on any funding. Uh, you know, the as you remember, there's sort of excess revenues flow down into a maintenance reserve fund and a capital reserve fund. This is just to make clear whether that money's there or not. The team has that responsibility. That was that amendment. Um, the next amendment entitled 17 at the top uh, makes the Metro government a third party beneficiary of the state funding agreement. Uh, sort of a tip of legal, very legal provision. The next one, amendment number 20, amends the ordinance. So this isn't technically a document in front of you, but we thought we would just sort of sort of mention it to you. Um, 
this amendment um, brings the minority participation uh, obligations of 7.8C in the development agreement also to the council. There's a reporting mechanism there. Um, and that, um, and as they amended it, um, if participation is less than 25, that requires um, explanation and, and a plan to the council. That's that amendment. Um, the next one is an amendment about sort of cas casinos generally. And I think, Tom, you jump in here probably go astray. Essentially what all of the, these amendments say is that the stadium, uh, the stadium itself will not operate as a casino. And a casino really is sort of what you think of roulette, you know, uh, th those kind of games uh, without the approval of the Metro Council. So regardless of what state law might say about whether uh, whether a facility like this could operate as a casino, um, Metro Council would get a say so. It is not intended and does not impact already permitted legalized sports betting. I think I've got that right. Or raffles, things like that. Um, now, the, the amendment sort of 27, um, the, the, the next two, let's also skip 27 because 28 supersedes 27 and the first one that I told you to ignore. What this last amendment does, and I believe this is the last amendment, is it is it increases um, the rent calculation under the lease. Before, the rent calculation was a, a flat three dollars on non NFL events. That that methodology me methodology's changed. It's a tad bit complicated. It is now the greater of three dollars or 3% on non-NFL events. And, and then when you look at those non-NFL events, there are some events that are excluded from the percentage calculation. They would be included in the, the raw $3 calculation, but you would have um, any college event, including TSU, Music City Bowl, CMA, ACM, Grammy Awards, WWE, those all would be still calculated as they were before at the flat $3, not the 3%. So that, that, that is a sort of there, there you go. Those are all of the amendments that the Metro Council adopted when they adopted the ordinance, which are new since this was last before you. And so that I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Jeff. Any questions? Great. If not, I will entertain a motion to approve the resolution affirming the approval of the documents and agreements relating to the development funding and operation of a new enclosed NFL stadium. So moved. There's a second. Any, any discussion, any questions? All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, opposed is nay. Thank you. At this time, we have Lillian Blackshear, also with Asbury and Sims, and she's going to walk us through the proposed amended and restated debt management policy for the authority. Glad to see you again. Good morning. Good morning. No, no. Everyone here? No. 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 She got used. Yes. Okay. All go. right. There we go. Okay. Um, as was stated previously, this would have typically gone before the Finance Committee, and so since the Finance Committee cannot meet this morning, we're going to talk about it in front of the full board. Obviously, as I go through this, if there are any questions that anyone has, obviously, please feel free to stop me. I'm happy to repeat myself or explain things a little bit more. Um, so before you is a resolution that would propose to amend and restate the authority's debt management policy. And there are two categories of amendments that are enclosed in those um, that policy before you. So the first category would be general cleanup. And these, these general cleanup items were actually um, proposed by Josh Thomas. So he's perfectly capable of talking to those amendments as well. But I'll, I'll speak to them. So um, there is some updating of some outdated statutory references in there. There is um, an edit to conform some language that relates to public records requests so that it matches language in the authority's public records policy. Just I'm sorry. I think it would be helpful if you um, back up a little bit in terms of 
um, some context for the debt management policy. We went through this prior to issuing bonds for GMS Park, but I think if you could give, especially for some of our new board members, some context of what we're doing. Absolutely. I appreciate that. So before you is the debt management policy. So state law requires that any entity that issues debt have a debt management policy. And so the state has developed guidelines that have required elements of the policy. So what you have in your debt management policy are all the things that the state says must be in a policy before an entity may issue debt. So part of that relates to um, obviously transparency, cost of professionals, part of it relates to um, how you disclose costs, and part of it relates to what we're going to talk about later, the approval of balloon debt. So that's the that's the, the document before you. So some of the items in that document needed to be cleaned up to fix some outdated statutory references that um, um, your counsel, Josh Thomas, provided. And then also there was some language that relates to the payment of um, copies for public records requests when when folks may request copies of financing documents how those items are paid and so um, one of the changes to the policy would be to make sure that the payment language in the policy when requesting copies of financing documents matches the authority's public records policy um, and Monica I don't know if you want any more information on the debt management policy background before I go into balloon debt Okay, um, and so the, the second category of amendments that would be before you in the debt management policy relate to balloon debt approval. Um, and balloon debt is a defined term in the state statute. It basically covers any financing that would go longer than 30 years or have debt service payments that would either not be level or decreasing. So if you had a bond issue, for example, which the authority has considered before, if you have a bond issue that has debt service payments that are increasing to meet increased revenues that will be received by the authority, then that could be considered balloon debt under state law. So in order to issue balloon debt under state law, the state requires two things. It requires the state to approve the issuance of that debt and it, approves the, it requires the authority to approve the issuance of that debt as well. So the state has developed a set of guidelines that would govern the issuance of balloon debt. So you've done this before in connection with previous stadiums. Obviously, there's a stadium that's going to be um, hopefully possibly financed soon. You'll have that bond resolution in front of you later. But the, the, the upcoming proposed stadium would likely fall under the definition of balloon debt. So when you are considering the issuance of that debt, you will need to approve that um, balloon debt issuance as well. So it's important that we go over the balloon debt approval process that's laid out in this debt management policy. So the state guidelines require that the authorities policy have language that one permits the issuance of balloon debt and that also sets forth the criteria that the authority can consider when deliberating over the issuance of balloon debt. So the amendments before you as they relate to balloon debt are intended to do two things. They are intended to streamline and simplify the balloon debt approval, approval process so that it stays consistent with state guidelines and maintains transparency with the public. Obviously, that's of high concern but that too reduces duplicative effort on the part of the board. So we can go line by line through each of the edits. I'm happy to do that, but it may be helpful if I just pull out the high points and talk about those edits that are significant for you. So the first um, high point, I guess, to consider of the amendments would be the allowance of the board to consider the balloon debt structure as part of its consideration of the bond resolution itself. So the policy as currently written requires the board to consider a balloon debt structure separate and apart and really before it can consider the bond resolution. And it seems like it will be helpful to have um, a more comprehensive discussion of the bonds if you were you would allow the board to consider those things together. So to consider the balloon debt structure at the same time as considering the bond resolution. So that will obviously eliminate a duplicative meeting of the board and, and the thought would be that that would be a more helpful um, discussion that could be had on the part of the board. So does anyone have any questions as it relates to that amendment? Any 
questions? Has, any, has everyone found that? If everyone has the red line in front of you, we can go to the um, to the section. So that would be in the section. It would be in section four, titled balloon debt, but on page eight. Okay. So I'm on um, subsection I which may be on page eight of the red line. So there's language that talks about the um, criteria, which you see the criteria when deliberating balloon debt would remain the same. But in that subsection two, there is the language that is deleted that would require the board to consider the balloon debt in a meeting separate and apart from the bond resolution. And if you keep reading through that section, it talks about how the balloon debt policy or the balloon debt plan would be submitted to the state and obviously posted on the authority's website to maintain the transparency. Um, but there's no need in this policy as amended to have that um, consideration be done separate from the bond resolution itself. Any questions? Yes. Um, I'm sorry, can, can you just back up and, and just define what balloon debt is one last time? Yes, thank you for that question. So balloon debt, I mean, if you think about a balloon, it's something that gets bigger as it goes down. If you're holding a balloon like this, the structure gets larger. So balloon debt under state law, so it's a defined term in state law. So balloon debt would be debt that goes out longer than 30 years and or debt that has debt service payments that are either not level or not decreasing. So balloon debt would be debt, it could be debt that goes out longer than 30 years or that has payment amounts annually that go up. And so a lot of times project financings will have increasing debt service payments that are structured to meet increasing revenues. So if, if you have project revenues that go up over time, bond issues may be structured in a way so that the payment that is owed by the authority would meet the revenues that are coming in from the project. Is that, is that helpful? This is a revenue bond, right? And it's based on revenues and that could change. So that, that makes it a balloon debt, right? Correct. There, right. Well, I don't want to get too much into the details of what will be before you later as far as the substance of the bond issue. But there could be two ways that a bond issue would be balloon debt. It would be one that, yes, the payment amounts would increase over time to meet the revenues that you would see. But the payment was to be structured, obviously, in a way that it would meet um, the revenues as they come in and, and, and not be in an issue where, or not be in a position where the fluctuations would matter, if that makes sense. And then also, if it went longer than 30 years, that would also be considered balloon debt under state law. So Lillian, did I hear you say that we have uh, utilized the balloon in past bonding? Right, and um, Jeff, I think you worked on the MLS stadium. Yeah. No, so um, I don't have anything to add to what she's saying. Just but for some experience, if, if you do if you do a deal that has a thirty year lease and you issue bonds at the beginning of the construction period, and the thirty year lease starts at the end of the construction period you're going to be balloon debt because you're going to be more than 30 right. years every time. And so um, I believe in, um, I believe with this facility, uh, and I am certain with the MLS facility, uh, and I am certain with the deal that will be brought before you, that's exactly, you know, that that is the structure. And I, the last thing I'll say by way of experience, I don't know if you recall on, I guess it was March 28th, when the, the Goldman folks were here, there was a guy named Jeff Scruggs, and he had a slide that showed the debt service. And it's as level as it can be with two exceptions. There's a, a jump up a little bit when the new stadium opens. And then there was another little jump up when the state holdback rolled off. But other than that, it was super duper level. But because of those two small jump ups and because of the 30 year thing, this is you're going to see this almost every time you get a deal. Sorry. I didn't mean to. No, it's, it's helpful. 
Well, it's helpful to know that this has been before you um, in previous stadium financing. It's not something that's unusual, but it is something that has to be approved, obviously, by the authority and then also by the state. I think we have one more question here. Lillian. Um, did you say that the state controller's office has also worked with Josh and reviewed the red lines, or is that something that happens next? I mean, well, we've that's a great question. So we have so the state has a set of guidelines that spells out what must be in an issuing entity's balloon debt approval language. So we went through the state guidelines, obviously checked the language as proposed against the state guidelines and confirmed that it worked. But we also did reach out to the comptroller's office and spoke to Sheila Reed about the language and got comfort that removing the language or revising the language that we are contemplating is fine per the state's opinion. So that's a great question. Great. Any other questions? Really appreciate the detail with, with your <laughs> giving us some insight. No, I, I, these terms I every day. appreciate the questions. They're great questions. Um, so I can I can continue um, to hit the other high points. So that so the the um, allowance of the consideration of the balloon debt structure at the meeting where the bond resolution is considered is one significant change that we think would help the discussion and obviously eliminate duplicative meetings of the board. Another highlight would be to revise language that was intended to refer to a prior um, requirement of the state that upon speaking with the comptroller's office is no longer required. So instead of having language specifically talking about the plan of managing balloon debt, which would be um, in the red line, let's see if I can find the section specifically. I think it would be the, it would, I think be on page six. So at the bottom of, of page six on the red line, there's language that talks about a plan for managing balloon debt. This would be something in addition to the plan of balloon debt that would need to be submitted to the state. That language I think it was intended to refer to a prior requirement of the state comptroller. We talked to Sheila Reedy at the comptroller's office. It's not something that's currently required. So instead of having that specific reference, we just put in language that generally the authority would comply with any state requirements. And then another, um, probably the final highlight to um, note would be in setting forth the criteria of the balloon debt approval process, instead of saying we'll consider all of the factors, um, obviously not all bond resolutions and not all bond structures are equal. They're not the same. So we, we changed that language to May. So we set forth our criteria, but obviously allowed flexibility in the board's deliberation process within state um, law parameters. So, so any questions about any of those proposed amendments? Questions or comments? Not. Thank you. So at this time, we'll entertain a motion to approve a resolution amending and restating the Sports Authority's debt management policy. It's a motion. It's been moved and properly second. Dis discussion? All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, there's nay. Motion passes. Thank you. Now we will consider approval of a resolution authorizing and approving expenses related to project management consultant services related to preliminary planning, design, and construction of a new East Bank Stadium. Uh, Monica, can you start the conversation? Okay. So I think this is in your binders, should be behind tab five, but under section 7.16 of the development agreement, the sports authority can appoint a construction representative. And I know you all are familiar with that. The cost of that is paid as part of the project budget. Um, we are finalizing a scope of work um, with the intention of soliciting this as an RFP and going through Metro Procurement to do that. Um, procurement has indicated that it will likely take four to six months to go through the process 
and bring um, that firm into contract. Um, we're hoping that at the end of the day that we get multiple proposals from, from local and national firms, but want to do everything that we can to ensure that the authority is, you know, gets the best representation possible. So in order to make sure that we are represented in the interim, um, we would like, this is staff making a request, that we use some of the existing Metro contracts um, for design consultant and project management, owner's rep, um, as a stopgap, essentially. Um, initial cost for this would be paid for from the ARENA revenue fund. Um, probably important to note, this is different from the ARENA account in which all of the revenue flows in and out from Bridgestone ARENA. The ARENA revenue fund, I know you've heard us talk about this over the years, um, is, is how we funded our um, project managers um, in the interim before bonds were issued for Geodis Park. Um, we also use the Arena Revenue Fund to help close out the cost related to Fort I Center Bellevue. And so essentially we're asking that the board would authorize and approve us to, um, to use the Metro existing contracts and to fund them from the Arena Revenue Fund until bonds are issued and at that time, we would be reimbursed similarly or exactly um, to how we handled Geodis Park. Um, you do have a resolution in front of you authorizing and approving these expenses um, not to exceed $80,000. And again, they would be reimbursed when the bonds are issued. Great. Questions or comments? I have Yes. What would the uh, design consultant do in this regard? What would be the, the responsibilities of a design consultant? So I think the sports authority, as you, you know, you're going to, we're going to hear from the Titans shortly in terms of the architect of record. But as the Titans and Stadco move into the design phase, then the development agreement does allow the sports authority to be part of that process. So we would be focused, like I said, we're, finalizing the scope, but the development agreement does speak to those things, and we can send those to you. I would think, Monica, that it also serves as a safeguard and protection for the authorities, so they're looking out for our well-being. I think that was one of the big issues during the discussion uh, with the stadium moving forward, so I think it's really a safeguard, but it's an interim, and then it'll be paid out of the uh, bond issue once we get to that place. Other questions or comments? If not, I will entertain a motion to approve a resolution authorizing and approving expenses related to the project management consultant services for preliminary planning, design, and construction of a new East Bank Stadium. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? Question? If not, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. Opposers nay and the motion passes. Thank you. So at this time we have Gil Beverly and Kellen DeCourcy with the Titans and they are here to discuss Stadco's selection and to share the firm's qualifications of the um, TBS architect of record for the construction. Good morning. Good morning. This on? Okay, great. <clears throat> Thank you guys for your time today. Um, I'm Gil Beverly, Chief Marketing and Strategy Officer for the Tennessee Titans. Here with my colleagues, Kellen DeCourcy, our project executive for the new stadium, and John Cooper, our outside counsel for Holland and Knight. We're here to talk you through our objectives, our thought processes, and ultimately to ask for your approval to move forward with our selection of, for the architect of record for the new stadium project. The selection is another milestone in what is a generational project for the city. You know, it feels like we've been talking about this for a long time and that we've come a long way, but yet we're really only at the beginning of this journey together with you guys. Um, the Titans continue to appreciate your partnership, your guidance to date, and are looking forward to collaborating going forward. So before we get into the specifics of our selection, John and Kellen are going to talk a little bit about our objectives, our process, and how we approach um, 
coming to this decision. Good morning. I'm John Cooper with Holland and Knight, outside counsel for the Titans. Um, as I mentioned to you last time I spoke to you, uh, there were questions about the architect of record process. Uh, the development agreement that was one of the transactional documents that Jeff Oldham referred to when, when he presented includes as an exhibit a procurement process that the Titans have to follow. Uh, basically, the Titans uh, will be serving as the procurement agent for the stadium on behalf of the authority uh, pursuant to the development agreement. And he, on the screen here, you have the two sections in the development agreement that reference that. I will not read that to you. So essentially what the stadium procurement process states is that the Titans will follow the Metro Procurement Code as it relates to procuring professional services to the greatest extent practical. And what that means is there are, there are two sections in particular in the Procurement Code that refer to professional services 4.08.080 and 4.12.040 and those are specifically referenced in the, the policy. The procurement code requires that architect services be procured through a request for proposals RFP process. Uh, this means that specifically in the procurement code, it states that architects are to be selected based upon recognized competence and integrity. Uh, price is a factor, but price is not the only factor that, that is to be considered. The, R the procurement code requires uh, that the RFP be posted for a minimum of 14 days. Uh, in this case, the architect of record procurement RFP was pr posted for 32 days to give firms ample time to review and respond. The, uh, moving on to minority participation requirements. The, the bulk of the stadium procurement process document that's incorporated into the development agreement uh, concerns minority contracting, um, at least half, half the document. And basically what it requires is for the Titans to work with Metro's business assistance office, which is a division of the, the purchasing agent, to exceed, meet and exceed any participation goals that the business assistance office sets for a particular area or or field, in, in this case, architect services. Um, so uh, in order to ensure that as the architect of record builds out the full design team, in order to ensure that minority per DBE participation is, is meeting those goals, the agreement requires there to be a monitor uh, that that the architect of record has to have on, on as part of its team who will monitor monthly and provide reports that will then be submitted to the, the sports authority for review showing utilization and progress towards those goals. Also, the procurement code requires or allows for an evaluation committee to help make a decision regarding the selection of an architect of record. In this case, the evaluation committee consisted of representatives from the Titans, from Metro, and from the Sports Authority. The committee interviewed the two finalist firms uh, on two different days and determined that both of the finalists had the necessary qualifications and capabilities to perform the services that, that are required to be architect of record on this pro project. Um, the, the, so the, the feedback, both the strengths and weaknesses were provided to the Titans and then the Titans made the selection with, which they will talk about further. Uh, it's important to note that um, after the entire 
process of negotiating the contract is complete, that contract will come back to this board for approval. So today you're being asked to approve the selection of the architect of record. You will later be asked to approve the contract once that is finalized, which will probably be in June. Good morning. Um, Kellen DeCourcy here, project executive with the Tennessee Titans, and good to see some familiar faces again. Um, here you're seeing a concept design rendering from our design architect, uh, Manica. Uh, next slide, please. So I want to just explain a little bit more about the role of the architect of record on the project, just otherwise known as AOR. Um, they play a critical role in the overall project and are responsible for the overall design phase of the project. They will basically be taking the concept design from our design architect, Manica, and help making that a reality. They'll be responsible for the overall uh, coordination and management of the design consultants through the design phase. They'll be responsible for making sure the stadium design meets all applicable building codes, standards, such as ADA, International Building Code, Health and Life Safety. They will then take the full uh, construction set of documents, submit those to Metro Codes for a full building permit set. Once we have the full building permit set, we will issue that to the final selected construction manager, which will then solicit for a guaranteed maximum price proposal, which is the GMP, which will wrap up the design phase. We will then move into the construction administration phase with the design architect, or the, the AOR, sorry. Um, and they will ultimately be responsible for the review of RFIs, submittals, on-site inspections and field reports. And this is a critical phase of the project to ensure that the materials and construction techniques are meeting our design specifications and standards. So I wanna talk a little bit about the timeline that, that John had outlined uh, for our RFP um, selection. So we posted the and notified of the RFP on February 8th on the Titans procurement website. On March 10th, all proposals were due and then on the 14th and 21st of April, we conducted our final interviews. And here today, we are here to present our selection to the Sports Authority for approval. And I'm gonna turn it over to Gil Beverly to talk a little bit about the firm, DBE, and next steps. Thanks, Kellen. So without further ado, um, as you see in your agenda, um, our selection or our proposed selection for the AOR for the stadium is a firm by the name of TVS. TVS is based in Atlanta, and they were chosen because they really stood out across a number of key criteria. First, it was the familiarity with Nashville. TVS was the AOR on the Music City Center, uh, which is one of the biggest and most successful projects in, in the city. Um, they've also been the AOR for a number of other major large-scale billion-dollar-plus projects, including Mercedes-Benz Stadium in Atlanta, the Javits Center in New York, as well as the Las Vegas Convention Center. Another thing that really attracted us to TVS is that they have a dedicated sports venue team, which we thought was a, you know, a real strong application given the nature of our project. And finally, they have a history of providing best-in-class services in an on-time and on-budget basis, with, which ultimately is critical to what we're trying to do. TVS has also traditionally embraced the challenge of maximizing DBE participation across their prior projects. They share in our commitment to inclusion and the desire to maximize opportunities for local and minority-owned businesses. As mentioned at the top, the Titans are utilizing Metro's process and standards to seek significant levels of DBE and local business inclusion. Also, in parallel path to our procurement processes, the Titans are launching programs supporting DBEs and small businesses through community partnerships with bodies such as the Citizens Bank, the National Business, I'm sorry, the Nashville Business Incubation Center, as well as Corner to Corner as part of our one community platform. Finally, we will continue to share information about opportunities for all businesses, but also with an emphasis on recruiting minority owned businesses and other locals. Um, through our website, TennesseeTitans.com slash procurement, which will list opportunities as they become available and solicit um, interest. Hopefully with your approval, with the AOR in the fold, the next big domino on the project will be the selection of the community, I'm sorry, the construction manager at risk. The RFP process for this has started with this past week with information on the Titans procurement site um, for the opportunity to indicate interest. 
Once selected and approved by the Sports Authority, we will enter into the design development phase. We've also posted many or multiple other opportunities for subconsultants on the procurement side as well. So we've given the opportunity for folks to raise their hand and, and to be considered at the time at the right time um, for participation into the project. We believe that TVS is the right partner for this phase of the project and are asking for your support in a, approving them as the AOR. And we ultimately know that this body is highly invested in this project, both as a, a collective and as individuals. And we appreciate that investment and attention that you guys have given us. Um, and beyond that, again, we appreciate your partnership and guidance. And we're really looking forward to working with you as we move forward. Um, it's been brought to my attention that apparently we'll be doing this a lot in the coming months. Uh, so we look forward to an ongoing dialogue, whether it's us or other members of the Titans leadership. And again, we really do appreciate your feedback. Um, with that, love to open up the questions. Thank you. Questions? Yes, is this thing on? It is. It is. Uh, I really appreciate the um, the job you guys have done in selecting or uh, going through the process of selecting an AOR. Uh, you mentioned a moment ago that the step after the AOR is to select a uh, construction manager at risk. Uh, what I'd like to know now is, does the AOR have a team of consultants that they that they will be working with, or is that something that will be done later? Uh, some of the firms and, and um, consultants that are listed there are firms that we hope to bring on board with uh, underneath TBS, but there are a handful of other um, consultants already engaged with Manica uh, to help make sure that we are proving out that the initial concept design was uh, was possible. Those are some of the some bigger players, um, structural engineers and mechanical, electrical, um, and code and life safety. They have already selected uh, structural A handful of those, those bigger firms are, are part of the project. So they've already selected uh, as part of their team uh, to um, enter into an agreement with once they are approved. Yes, though, ultimately those contracts will fall under TBS's management, um, and they are, um, as, as, as we can once we have approval, if that's um, here today, then we will have them have conversations to um, finalize agreements. Now I'm trying to, is, are you saying the, the consultants are on this screen? Those firms are still unselected. Oh, the consultants are still unselected. Correct. But you have a list, and is that list limited to only certain firms? No, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I guess we have a handful of um, open positions, roles, and disciplines that need to be filled. And they would be in the primary uh, fields, uh, structural, mechanical, electrical? Th those are um, engaged. Those firms are already yeah. engaged. Yeah, there's a set of firms that have been engaged to help get us to the point that we we are now. Some of those firms will continue on to work with TVS, and those were some of the categories Kellen mentioned. Uh, the firms are the areas listed on the screen are still open and yet to be secured. Okay, uh, would it be possible for you to name the firms that are already engaged? So uh, for MEP, that's SSR. They're a local firm. They also have brought on board um, minor minority and DBE participation as well. And then uh, Walter P. Moore was a structural engineer of record. They were also engaged in GEOTIS. Uh, they have also engaged with the local and minority um, subconsultant to be part of their team. Um, code, code and Life Safety is how. Um, they've been involved with every major project in the city. Um, low Voltage, that's ME Engineers. Um, there's a handful of others, but those are the major ones. And again, um, as Gil was pointing out, they were critical to help make sure that the project from the outset was a reality for us. Thank you. I'm just thinking. Okay, go, go, I have a question, mm -hmm. maybe for John. On the resolution that we're looking at, there's exhibits, or exhibit A, but that nothing's listed. What, what would be in there? I couldn't find it in reference to that resolution. It is incorporated into the development agreement as an exhibit. Um, it, my, it probably just didn't get sent over. Um, I will give Monica a copy and then email it to you. But it's the, the actual stadium procurement process that is incorporated into the development agreement. 
Yes, we have another question. Two quick questions. So when the committee um, picked the two finalists, um, who on the Titan side made that decision? And then the other question is, um, um, who 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 was the other firm that lost? So in terms of narrowing down um, the four initial um, submissions to the two finalists, um, it was, you know, Titan's <laughs> leadership. So all of us represented here as well as mothers, as well as our owner's rep. Um, and we went through, you know, a pretty exhaustive uh, evaluation of, you know, across all the, the relevant criteria uh, to narrow it down to the two. Um, and then, you know, we that was in... We wanted to, since we were engaging a number of folks um, that were outside of our organization, we wanted to be mindful of their time and to create an efficient um, opportunity to weigh in. So that's why we narrowed it down to two from there. Um, then what, oh, the other firm was, uh, the, the other finalist was Moody Nolan, um, as well as in partnership with Hastings. Yes. I have one other question with reference to the firms that have already been engaged. Uh, was the selection of those firms in accordance with uh, Metro's procurement guidelines? Was it, were they competed positions or services? Uh, essentially, yes, to the point that John made to uh, the best of our ability. We were following a Metro procurement process. We, we had interviews with a handful of the major firms that are in each of those disciplines to uh, land on the best firm um, with, with a commitment towards DBE as well. So that was a selection process in which they submitted their qualifications. Yes, we, we had, um, we, we vetted out a handful, two to three, in each of those major disciplines. Okay. Yeah, I would also point out that when these firms were selected, it was before there was actually a project. This was to get us to the point of determining whether it was feasible to build a stadium at this location in, in the manner that, that the Titans needed. So. So that started significantly before engage the public engagement process. But does that mean that, that those firms were providing services pro bono? No. No, there, there, was, there were fees involved in, in um, establishing the concept design, and those were paid for by the Titans. Okay. And, okay. I'm not understanding it, though. Okay, thank you. Happy to follow up offline if you'd like, Melvin. Okay. Thanks to everyone for your questions and for your insight. Um, Director Gill served on this committee uh, for the board, so we thank you for the time. And it's in your area of expertise, so we appreciate your questions. Yes. Okay. So, um, as you know, before I call for a motion, um, I'll remind the board that the authority is unable to unreasonably withhold uh, condition or delay approval unless there's some significant reason for doing that. So I will entertain a motion for approval of TVS architecture as architect of record for the construction of a new enclosed NFL stadium. Is there a motion? Second. Moved and properly second. Any further discussion? If not, everyone in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. Opposers, nay, and the motion passes. Thank you all. We really appreciate it. Appreciate it. Next on the agenda, it's, uh, as you all know, this spring, the General Assembly had considered and ultimately passed a bill which reconstitutes our board and changes the way the Sports Authority members will be appointed moving forward. The governor signed the bill, which goes into effect January 1 of 2024. So Josh Thomas, our legal advisor, is here to walk us through the bill and its implications and address any questions that the authority might have. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so behind tab seven, you have a copy of the amendment to the House bill, which actually was, which is what was ultimately adopted by the General Assembly and signed by the governor. Um, as the chair mentioned, um, beginning January 1st, this board is going to be reconstituted. So you will remain a 13-member board. But the biggest change is going to be how the appointments are made to the board. Um, so currently, all 13 appointments are made by the mayor and confirmed by council. Um, when this new law goes into effect, um, it is now going to be seven members that are appointed by the mayor and confirmed by council. And then the other six are going to be appointed by state officials. And the state officials are going to be the governor, who's going to have two appointments, 
the House Speaker who's going to have two appointments um, and the Lieutenant Governor will have two appointments. And so the way that it is structured is, is as of uh, June 30th, the seven members who will remain on the board as of the beginning of 2024, the longest standing members of the board as of June 30th are there to be reappointed to those positions. Um, and then obviously the other six positions by the state officials will be appointed by the, the respective appointing authorities. And the positions are going to be staggered, where essentially the, the terms will still remain to be six years total terms. But um, to make it work out with this new reconstitution of the board, um, the new appointees are going to have basically uh, shorter terms in the six years to basically get us to a uh, rotating roll off of board members. So for the uh, mayor's appointments, um, they're going to stay on the board, um, I believe, until, forgive me, I think I... I think until June 30th, actually, I'm sorry, I apologize. I don't have it written down. But the governor appointments are going to last until uh, June 30th, 2025, when they were appointed. The lieutenant governor's uh, positions are going to last until um, June 30th, 2029. Then the speaker of the House appointments are going to last until uh, June 30th, 2027. Um, one other thing to mention about the legislation is, is that, or actually two things, is that the legislation does require for the appoint the appointing authorities to endeavor to have one female director and one director of a racial minority. And also one thing to also note, which also is a, is a major item, is that um, before all members of this board were residents uh, that lived here in Davidson County, but with now with the state officials being able to appoint folks, um, there is the ability or there likely will be um, board members who are outside of Davidson County and actually from other parts of the state. Um, in fact, with respect to the governor's appointments, it is required that basically one of those appointments be someone who is not from the middle division um, of the state. So. Uh, again, short of it is that beginning um, next year, um, this board is going to look a little bit different with basically six new appointments to the board. But as Madam Chair mentioned, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer those. Thank you. Questions or comments? Josh, can you just hang on. Yeah, it's on. It's on. There you go. Okay. Can you tell me what the process is for the appointees that's going to be made uh, by the governor and the lieutenant governor and the speaker? What is their vetting process? You know, the, the ones that are picked now for this board is vetted by the, the, the uh, Metro Council. And uh, can you tell me how the new appointments will be made and what, what is the vetting process? Well, I have a very unsatisfactory answer for you. I, I do not know. Um, obviously, the, the governor just signed the legislation last week, um, so I don't know if they have developed that process or know what that process is, but I'll certainly look into that and try to get an answer for you. Okay, and my next question is, uh, these people that are that appointed by those folks are, are liable to come from every part of the state, which would require them to drive maybe long distance and maybe spend the night and uh, which would afford uh, them some expense reimbursement. Would Metro be on the hook for that reimbursement or the state? That is also a good question and another unsatisfactory answer for you. That is something that we're still trying to figure out. Um, I believe Monica may have been in communications or talked um, with us about that. Um, so we we'll still need to figure that out. But in theory, the way the legislation is written is that the sports authority would be able to reimburse those individuals for those expenses. But again, how that looks, given that you do have members who um, may be coming from other parts of the state, we'll still need to figure out how that looks. But obviously, it would not be a good thing for the metro people to have to pay for those expenses. I will not respond to that, but I, I understand I understand the point that you're making. <laughs> okay, and so now my next question is the seven that's supposed to be uh, reappointed by the mayor by June the 30th, if I understood correctly well so the the legislation is actually uh, worded very uh, confusingly so basically what the legislation says is the longest standing members as of June 30th are to be reappointed to the board beginning on January 1st of 2024 so in theory the reappointments are going to happen later in the year okay we, we got some members that, that fall into the category of those seven 
whose terms expire between now and that time, what happens there and who, who, who appoint, reappoints them, the new mayor? Yes. The short answer is yes. Thank you. Any other questions? As always, thank you, Josh, for keeping us abreast. Appreciate it. Next on the agenda, um, we have Benjamin Eagles from the mayor's office, Jerry Caldwell with Bristol Motor Speedway, and Tom Cross, who will briefly discuss the Fairground Speedway proposal. Good morning, gentlemen, and welcome. Is this on? Yes. Great. So since I was last year uh, walking through the proposed deal uh, with Bristol Motor Speedway, uh, we have made significant progress. Uh, the project has been approved uh, by the Fair Board. And uh, I would like to point out that during the Fair Board's um, review of the project, they commissioned a uh, facility analysis uh, to uh, uncover exactly uh, what the facility backlog in terms of maintenance is at the Speedway. Uh, it's a it's a uh, pretty old old facility, and there hasn't been a significant investment from Metro to keep it up to a, a safe standard. Uh, so that study was performed by Driven International, um, a, a group of consultants uh, with experience at uh, racetracks around the world, and they evaluated um, dozens of different components at at the facility, everything from ADA compliance to uh, safety of um, spectators and drivers and things like repaving and concessions. Uh, total estimated bill uh, from Driven International uh, is some 41.2 million. Uh, and and uh, that is an obligation that Metro needs to take seriously because of the Metro Charter obligation uh, to maintain historic uses at the fairgrounds, including auto racing. Uh, so now that we've gone through the through the fair board, um, the sort of next steps with this project are uh, review and consideration uh, by the sports authority, and then filing with Metro Council. Uh, with regards to that that forty one million dollar uh, figure, uh, one one of the great features of this proposed agreement uh, with Bristol is it utilizes significant private sector investment uh, as well as leveraging investment from the state and uh, tourist revenue via uh, in, uh, NCVC. So as the fair board embarks on consideration of the project, I uh, would like to invite uh, the board uh, to tour the facility. If there's interest, uh, we can set that up uh, with Director Womack. And uh, joining me today, uh, Jerry, to talk more about the project from Bristol's uh, standpoint, as well as Tom. Well, thank you guys for letting us uh, join you today. So grateful to be here. Um, the origins of this project really are back six years ago is when this conversation started. Marcus Smith, our CEO, has, a, has had a long passion for the history of the Nashville Fairground Speedway, uh, what it has meant to Nashville and what it's meant to uh, the sport of NASCAR. Uh, it, we also, as a company, have a great love for Nashville uh, as a city and, and what it stands for and the wonderful things that are going on here. Some additional information about Bristol Motor Speedway. We're part of Speedway Motorsports. Uh, we've been in business for 60 years. Uh, we operate 12 facilities across the country, uh, including Atlanta Motor Speedway, Charlotte Motor Speedway, Las Vegas Motor Speedway, and, and several others. The Fairground Speedway has a special place in the history of Nashville and the history of motorsports in our entire country. It's the second oldest continually operating speedway in the country. And it's one year older than the Ryman Auditorium. And that speedway is really a special place for Nashville, uh, but it has fallen into a state of disrepair. The track in its current uh, condition really does not reflect well for Nashville uh, and the folks that, that participate out there now and is a financial drain. It's also dangerous for competitors, for fans, and for the employees that are involved. We're excited about this opportunity really to address a problem and create something that we believe can be really special, being partners with the city on this project, bring a progressive vision uh, with resources to address what's been really a long time frustration out there and neglect of the facility. We will work with the community to preserve the historic 
Speedway property, complete that modernization of the fairgrounds property as a whole, improve the experience for the neighborhoods uh, around the Speedway by reducing the sound that's emitted from the, the Speedway, and being able to address and offer more parking options during non-racing events, such as soccer and flea market. One of our stated goals has been to bring NASCAR back to the fairgrounds. Uh, the return of NASCAR provides the resources to support that renovation and relying on uh, without relying on taxpayer dollars and bring long overdue safety improvements to the track and the, and the facility. But I do want to be clear, when we talk bring back NASCAR, what we're referring to is one, one race weekend every two years. Uh, this partnership will be about so much more than that one weekend, but that one weekend does produce uh, the revenue uh, to justify this project. And we'll proudly restore this historic racing facility and create a multi-purpose community facility. The rendering that I believe is up, um, this just shows you some of the, the current conditions. This is a project that we're working on over in North Carolina at North Wilkesboro Speedway, where we've taken something that had sat dormant since 1996 and restored it to um, modern standards and, and a facility that will run races this weekend. These are some pictures from out at the fairgrounds currently. Uh, just showing you the challenges uh, of an aging facility, drainage issues, and other things. And this is a rendering. We're still in the design process. Um, this is a version of the concept that we'll, we will be bringing back to this group to show as we go further down the path. But it's increased seating capacity, connectivity to the expo buildings and the rest of the campus, improved infield for better support, uh, around the racing activities and other events. This includes improvements in the infield that would uh, allow for 50% increase in parkable area for non-racing events. And then finally, and most importantly, sound mitigation, the installation of a sound reduction wall that in conjunction with the enforcement of muffler rules uh, will reduce the perceived loudness in the surrounding area by 50%. Thank you for your time and your consideration. Uh, I'll hand it over to Tom Cross as he goes over the financials of the deal structure. Good morning. I'd, I'd like to emphasize first that you're not being asked to approve anything today. This is all just informational and um, we'll be happy to come back and do the kind of work session that we did on the Titans documents uh, to go over things in more detail. But I think it would be helpful just to sort of uh, highlight some of the similarities between this deal and other ones that you've done, and also a couple of important differences. So the two main documents, as on all these deals, are a development agreement and a lease. And development agreement defines how the project is going to be built and who is responsible for what during the construction process, and the lease defines what's going to happen later. So that's like all of your other deals. But different on this one is the fair board is actually going to be the administrator of both the development agreement and the lease. The sports authority is involved as, as the financing entity, and uh, I'll, I'll get Lillian and Jeff to help me to, if you have more in-depth questions about why. But the sports authority has the power to issue bonds for some purposes, sports authority, sports facilities in particular, that municipal governments do not have. So the plan here and the, the, the set of documents that's involved also includes a lease of the property to the sports authority and then a lease back to Metro uh, acting by and through the through the fair board. So the fair board is actually going to be the entity that oversees the construction, participates in the in the uh, design process, and then administers the lease going forward. Um, the project is going to be financed by about $70 million worth of bonds that to be issued by the sports authority. Um, we don't know the exact number yet because it depends on the interest rate that obtains at the time the bonds are going to be issued. But they're limited by what we expect the revenues from the project to be. And we have had those uh, vetted by CSL, which also a different guy, but the same firm did uh, an assessment of the revenue projections for the for the Titan Stadium. So um, th this is a this is a bond amount that we feel is reasonably supportable. By, by the revenue projections that, that we have. Um, the, the, there's going to be some rent paid by Bristol, a million dollars a year, escalating at 1%. Uh, $650,000 a year from the, the CVC and some variable rent um, in part based on attendance and in part based on revenues that are generated on na na non-NASCAR events such as food and beverage and, and other general revenues. 
So that's that's what is going to go towards supporting the bonds, and uh, that's a, a big part of the development agreement. Um, the, the, as Jerry mentioned, they're, they're already in the process of those kind of the in, initial design work. This project is going to be uh, designed and constructed using a de design build process rather than the, the uh, process that the sports authority is most accustomed to, which is a separate uh, architect. You know, you guys had a long um, architect of record discussion this morning, usually on the, on the construction manager at risk projects. A, a construction manager and, and designer are selected at the same time, and they work together. Uh, through the design process, the CM eventually gives a, a proposal for a GMP that the owner either accepts or rejects or they negotiate something. In this case, it's a design builder that, that uh, Bristol has selected based on the development agreement. And so instead of two separate entities working on the design, you have, you have one, usually a joint venture, but uh, they, it also results ultimately in a, in a guaranteed maximum price, which is a not to exceed number, not a fixed price that the owner can either accept or reject. And in this case, um, the GMP has to be within the budget, effectively, the, the sources of revenue that are available. Or Bristol has to either agree to make up any shortfall or uh, terminate the project. So th there's going to be an important uh, work done, um, not only on the design, but to make sure that the GMP is, is within the budget. And of course, um, Bristol will have an important decision to make if it's, if it's not within those sources of revenue. So the, our bonds, the, or the Sports Authority's bonds, plus a $17 million grant from the state, plus $17 million uh, payment from the CVC, uh, which is intended to be for effectively tourism promotion. So they'll get to use the facility some, too. I assume they'll get some, some advertising um, within the facility. Maybe Jerry can elaborate a bit on that. The, of the $17 million that's coming from the CVC, some portion of it is going to be used for pre-construction and, and design. So the way the initial design work and pre-construction work that the design builder is doing is coming from that CVC contribution. So that's a, a 100 miles an hour description of what's in the development agreement. Um, assuming that the GMP is accepted or some version of it is, it turns into a basic construction project like every other construction project. And the Sports Authority, or, the, or rather Metro, has... Uh, the option of selecting a construction representative. You had a discussion about something like that for the Titan Stadium. Again, that construction representative's cost can be paid for through the project budget to liaise with the, with the Sports Authority and the Fair Board during construction. So once the project is complete, then we'd switch over to a 30-year lease agreement, which has a lot of the same features that are in the other Sports Authority leases that are out there, um, uh, somewhat like the Titans agreements that you have seen, Bristol would be responsible for all capital repairs and maintenance obligations during the 30-year term, though there should be some funding available for that, as, as is true with the Titans agreements. Um, after the bonds have been paid, there's a, there's a waterfall after, the, after debt service is paid, and, and one portion of uh, the one stop in the waterfall is for capital and maintenance, but, but it, to the extent there's not enough money in that fund, Bristol is still responsible for capital needs and, and all maintenance at their cost if need be. Um, Jerry mentioned that they're not required to bring NASCAR races, but the expect expectation is that they will every other year or so. Uh, there's a schedule in the lease uh, for the years when a NASCAR race is, is expected to be held. And to the extent that they are, are not, not able to bring a NASCAR race in those years and they have to pay a little extra in rent to make up for the difference in revenues that we're expecting to pay the bonds off. Um, he mentioned a couple of important community cons concerns. One of them is um, the sound. Um, the sports authority hears, I'm sure, some of, some of the board members probably hear about sound complaints even from the, the soccer stadium. Um, obviously, it's a concern for the existing racing facility, but the design, one of the, one of the design standards that they have to adhere to is to incorporate sound mitigation features in, in sound walls for the, for the track and also um, as the rest of the structures on the fairgrounds are built out, there's an expectation that it will limit the sound out in the neighborhood based on a, the work of a sound consultant that uh, Bristol hired, uh, recommended by the chair of the fair board, who happens to be an audiologist by profession. So part of the lease involves um, some sound mitigation obligations that Bristol will, will have to adhere to, to to be sure that the community does see the sound reductions that are expected based on that consultant's work. 
Also, there are important curfews for just about everything except for NASCAR races, so all other races and concerts and other kinds of events. They'll have to limit the times when they can practice racing or hold, hold other events in the fairground so as to minimize the disruption in the community and the effect on, on the, the school that's, that's nearby there as well. Another community concern that's been expressed um, at several of the fair board meetings had to do with the availability of parking. I, I, I know that this board has also heard a little bit about that with respect to uh, events at Geotis, and uh, obviously there needs to be a lot of coordination between the fairgrounds users, including Bristol and uh, National Soccer Club and the fairgrounds itself, which also obviously conducts a lot of events. And so there, there are obligations built into the lease that are intended, um, again, to minimize disruption to the community and make sure there's adequate par parking uh, provisions for events. Uh, again, uh, I, hate, I hate to do this to you. I'm trying to be respectful to your time, <laughs> but uh, we are happy to come back and do a more detailed um, look at all these documents and turn them page by page. And, and answer more questions. I'm happy to take a shot at the questions you might have today, but if you want to, if you want to think about them, and particularly since you should have copies of the documents uh, by the next time, but we meet if, if, uh, for a, a special meeting or, or otherwise, uh, that that might be uh, the most efficient use of your time. We definitely appreciate it. time. But we thought it would be great to start the conversation. I was speaking with Jerry earlier, and uh, this conversation has been going on for quite a while. This is not the first time we've had this conversation. Looks like a lot has transpired since that time. So we appreciate the updates. I, ask, I have one question. You talked about a lot of things that are like in terms of the other facilities that we are associated with. But would this be unique in that this would be the first bond issue that the Sports Authority would issue where we didn't have direct oversight of the venue? I, I think that's correct, yes. this this. Um obviously your role is to this whole process is critical but it is it is not going to be necessary for this board to administer the lease as you do for all of the other sports authority funded projects so i would assume we would have no financial obligation well actually something i should have mentioned is metro will be backstopping 100 percent of these bonds so there's no you know to the extent that there's there's concern about that that that's that's all all the risk for that is going to be on metro Good. any other questions or comments yes um, who is responsible for the maintenance? Uh, you've talked about that. Uh, about that. Who is responsible for the maintenance on the facility? Today, it's Metro and the fairgrounds. I'm talking and about on the go, new going new. forward. It will be 100 percent on Bristol. Okay. Yeah. And then Ben, did you say? Um, did you? Say, yeah. I'm on. Um, yeah, yeah. When when it you started the presentation, was the number 42 million? Is the assessment of if you brought the current track up to yeah. par? The consultant's report showed 41.2. Um, that could be somewhat of a menu or sort of phased in over time. Uh, the different so that's the current liability to Metro General Government now for maintenance. And then we're saying under this new concept proposal, it would be zero moving forward. That's correct. And, and, to be clear and, and fair, um, Metro uh, could continue to, to operate a facility that is not ADA compliant, is not safe for fans, safe for drivers. Um, they, we, we could continue to do that for some period of time. Um, there are um, elements uh, of the maintenance backlog that really aren't um, even optional um, at, at some point. the pavement deteriorates and the stands fall apart, for instance. Um, but the consultant uh, took sort of a careful route of, of options to, to, to phase it in over time. But yes, that is the, the total amount. Yes, Madam Chair. Um, I'd like to know, uh, with reference to the design builder process, uh, was the procurement process followed or done in association with Metro procurement? The development agreement requires that they uh, adhere to the Metro procurement code in the same way that the Titans agreements require them to do so. Um, I'm not as familiar with the selection process that they actually use, but we did, they, they did coordinate with us on what would be required under Title IV if Metro were doing the procurement itself. So um, Jerry can tell you more about who they interviewed and how they went about selecting them. I would like to know that. And John, 
John may be able to dive into it. We did create a committee. It had three Metro representatives, uh, two from the fair, fair uh, executive director, um, chair of the fair board, uh, and then Mark Sturdivant, and then two representatives from our team to, to select this initial design. Do you want to dive into that? Yes, we, uh, John Cooper, Holland and Knight, uh, also working with Bristol, um, we did ensure that the process that is outlined in the development agreement was followed as if that development agreement had been in place. So the the uh, design builder was selected using that same process that that uh, we went through, uh, that the Titans went through, and and that as as Jerry explained. So yes, that it was it was followed as if the development agreement had been in place. So I'm assuming that the entire uh, design build team is, has been put together. The design build firm has been selected. They are still early stages of design. Um, so they will obviously be building out their team if the project moves forward. But as of now, they're just in their early stages. And I'm speaking simply of the uh, uh, strictly of the design team. The, the entire design team has been selected by the design builder. Are there local firms on yes. that team? Yes, and I can get you, you a list. I'll get you a you list please, of them. Sure, please? absolutely. Questions or comments? Madam Chair, yes. Um, just out of curiosity, um, how many race events are being held at the fairgrounds right now? on an annual basis. I think we've probably gone over that, but I just, just for education of the board. I, I think there are about 10. 10 race events? Yes. Okay. Am I, gotcha. Right. 10 and 25 testing. Right. So it's, yeah, important to note right now, there, there are also 25 days for, for practices or testing. Okay. On top of the 10 events? Yeah. So, so 35 the, the, the altogether. Race so what? 35 altogether? I don't know that it comes to 35 because I think some of them probably take place on the same, on the same day. day. Okay, yeah. And this is being reduced. The number we commit to is less. <laughs> okay, gotcha. Um, and then also in reference, um, just to make sure that I heard this correctly, so the state has agreed to $17 million. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, gotcha. I'm sorry, what did you say, John? The state has already appropriated that amount, okay. so they're not waiting to issue bonds. Okay, um, gotcha. It's just straight appropriation. Gotcha. They putting anybody on the fair board? I'll strike that last question. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. A design bill firm. Okay. Great. So clearly there's a lot of interest, and uh, we do welcome the opportunity to dig deeper. Um, Perhaps there is a work session in our future. <laughs> and uh, again, thank you for being here. And uh, we'll look forward to hearing more. Appreciate it. So as always, this is the time where we open the floor to the board for any, of, any questions for our facility managers, teams, partners. Any questions that you'd like to ask? Okay, may I direct another question to Josh? Yes. Uh, a couple of questions I forgot to ask you while I go, Josh. Would the, the, the six members appointed from anywhere in the state, would they be allowed to vote on projects that Metro is funding? That's a good question. I, th I think the answer is yes, but let me, let me confirm that for you. Okay, that um, needs to be confirmed. Then the next question would be, would any of these folks be, be allowed to hold any of the officer positions on the board? Yes, I mean, they will be full members of the board, just like current board members, so yes. Okay. Great. I have a question. Yeah. Also, like, I'd like to ask you this, too. Uh, how, how does this affect our, our staff? Uh, will the staff be uh, appointed by the uh, uh, Metro? So obviously the sports authority appoints the executive director. So that will say the same, whether or not it's this board or, or the reconstituted board. And then the executive director chooses the staff that works for, for the sports authority. So uh, I think the short answer to your question is it will all remain the same. Obviously, if the board changes the executive director, that would obviously have changes that will flow down. But 
But they are, oh, they are civil service. Okay, so they're civil service employees, so it would not change, actually, as far as the, the other staff. Madam Chair, I have yes. one additional question on this yes. topic. Okay. Um, thank you, legal counsel. I appreciate your help on this. Um, and uh, I've, I've asked this question before, and I suspect I know the answer, but can, can you maybe articulate for the board as to how the state has authority over this and have the, how they have the authority to, um, uh, uh, yes, to, uh, to make these decisions to reconstitute our board? So I think the short answer to your question is, I mean, obviously the sports authority, whether or not it's this sports authority or any other one across the state is a creature of the state. Um, the General Assembly created the sports authorities. And so arguably they have the ability to change how they are structured. So I think the general answer to your question is um, if they can create it, then they should have the ability to be able to change it as well. Thank you. Great. And to the, to the authority, I'll just say that Josh is available. So if you need to reach out to him directly for additional questions, feel free. I'm sure he will accommodate us. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, if I may, I, I don't know if this is uh, the proper time to um, broach uh, this subject, but I'd like to know if it's possible. I've talked to uh, an individual who has given me insight on the fact that there are some boards that have uh, uh, executive directors who are under contract. And I'd like to know if that is something that uh, this authority might be able to do with reference to the executive director. Um, I think that's something we could definitely look into. However, I think that should be a conversation with the personnel committee and the personnel committee. Ironically, I have on the agenda that we will be meeting soon, so we can talk okay. about that. Thank you. Any other questions? We're going to move on with the agenda now. So we have, uh, we definitely want to hear from the Nashville Sounds and First Horizon. Um, and we have General Manager Adam Noose and Assistant GM Vice, uh, Ooh, Vice yeah. Wrong Adam. Wrong Adam. Oh, he I'm was reading, here, but I'm he reading, left. I am Adam English. <laughs> there are two Adams on here. Okay, we'll take you, Adam. <laughs> Hope I don't disappoint. Okay, and Doug Scopel. Uh, Doug, Doug, Doug apologizes. He had a yeah, call at know. noon with the subcommittee okay, for Major League Baseball, so he had so to leave. Uh, so it's just me. Okay. Um, so welcome to everybody. It's always it's always an honor to host you guys here at First Horizon Park, and it's a good opportunity for us to tell you guys a little bit about what's going on. Uh, to direct you to the slides, um, you know, our season has started off. We played 21 home games, uh, a lot of the same with fireworks. We did make a major improvement to the ballpark this year. You can see in the bottom right corner, we put in an all-turf wiffle ball field that's free of charge for kids to play on throughout the game. It's been a huge hit. There's lights, so at night they can play on it. Um, and has really been one of the most popular spots in the ballpark uh, so far in 2023. Um, to wrap up 2022, we did win the Minor League Baseball Organization of the Year. Uh, first time in the 45-year history of the Sounds. Uh, it was a tremendous honor for our ownership, um, our front office staff, our game day staff, all the way down to the fans in Nashville. It was really, uh, really one of the most proud things uh, I think you can, you can win in Minor League Baseball. Uh, for this upcoming year, we partnered with uh, our friends over at the Predators to put together a, a hit city hockey jersey giveaway that was a huge hit with fans so thanks sean henry and his whole team over there for working with us on that um a number of giveaways that we still have upcoming we're doing a corduroy hat the the picture on the right there is a a, a cooler sleeve um we always like to honor our country legends uh we did some uh uh, little nesting dolls of our country legends. Uh, we are expanding our program uh, through Copa de la Diversión, uh, where we transform into the Vihuelas de Nashville. Uh, we're good doing a scarf giveaway, and we're also expanding the number of games. Typically, we only do that for one weekend. We're now choosing at least one game per month to take on that identity. Um, and like the rest of Nashville, we decided to embrace the pickleball craze, and we are doing two installations of a pickleball paddle giveaway. Uh, the first of which was a couple weeks ago. Um, I always like to talk about our community initiatives and keep the keep the board up to date on what we're doing in the community. Uh, there's a short video here. Uh, we have done two installations of our pop-up baseball where we show up to an elementary school uh, with equipment, uh, balls, everything, and, uh, and the, the kids don't really know why we're there. Uh, and we just teach them how to play baseball, and then we leave the equipment with them. So we've done two of those thus far. We, we plan at least three more over the course of, uh, of the summer and fall. 
Um, through the Nashville Sounds uh, Foundation Scholarship, we give away $10,000 in college scholarships to deserving people. Uh, we did the first uh, of those check giveaways. Actually, that was last Saturday. So um, and we will continue to do those. And, and it's just an exciting way for us to support, you know, continued education for, for local Nashvillians. Uh, we do a number of jersey auctions. We just did our military appreciation one. We auction those off. They go to different charities uh, depending on the different theme. We do play on uh, June 15th this year, so we are going to do a 615 day with the proceeds of that jersey going to the victims of the Covenant School shooting. Um, last year, I spoke a little bit about our The Nine initiative. Uh, it's a, it's a, a black community fan engagement initiative. Uh, we are continuing to expand on that. Last year, we honored Norman Turkey Stearns. This year, we are honoring and trying to continue to tell the stories of, of the, the African-American baseball players that paved the way in Nashville. We're honoring Tom Wilson, who was the owner of the Nashville Elite Giants, as well as Bruce Buddy Petway, uh, who, for all intents and purposes, was, you know, the elite catcher of his time. They, the, actually, one of the teams that he played on played against the Detroit Tigers, uh, and he threw Ty Cobb out trying to steal three times in one game. Uh, just an a all-around tremendous baseball player. So we're excited to continue to educate our fans there. Um, we're actually working with the Black Sports Business Academy uh, to gather more and more resumes of interested people who can come do internships, paid internships with us to learn the business side of the sport. Uh, so we'll have five to six individuals joining us throughout the summer. And one of, their, um, one of the people through this academy is also um, designing a Juneteenth shirt that our, our team will wear during batting practice on June 19th. So we're really excited about some of those initiatives. Also on June the 24th, um, we, it, that's the game where we will be giving away and honoring, uh, you know, Tom Wilson and, and, and Buddy Petway. Uh, we're also giving away a blanket to our, our fans that highlights Jefferson Street and North Nashville around us and really all the, the HBCUs and, and, and really honoring the neighborhood that we're, that we're invested in here. Uh, we're also going to make a major announcement about a community project at that time, too. I can't really speak more about it uh, until then, but uh, be on the lookout for that. It's a really exciting uh, community initiative. Um, we also do a crossroads camp uh, where, uh, you know, a variety of deaf and hard of hearing kids come out and we teach them baseball. Um, I mentioned Copa de la Diversión. Um, and the Sertoma Fantasy Camp, this is, I'm sorry, the, the Sertoma Fantasy Camp is children who are deaf or hard of hearing come out. They learn catching, throwing, all kinds of stuff around baseball. Is there anything else there? And that is my last slide. So we have a ton of stuff packed into uh, uh, 2023. We've started off between April and the first part of May, right where we, right where we left off at the end of last year. We're, we're trending to exceed even last year's numbers. Uh, we have such a great fan base and, and appreciate the support of all this board as we, as we uh, continue in 2023 and beyond. Awesome. Any question? questions? Comments? Comments? I'm, I'm just taken aback with all the activities that you all have going on. For the families, it's just unbelievable. Well, thank you very much for saying that. We really do put a lot of time and effort into it, and we just have we have the best staff in in, in minor league baseball, and and uh, that really focus on all those details to try to make those memories. So I, I appreciate you saying that. I love the pop up baseball idea. I think that's amazing. But I'm really intrigued with the nine initiative. And I'm just curious, the pipeline for those interns, how do you all get... So we have relationships with Tennessee State. Um, we actually work with Meharry on a free dental clinic that we provide out here. But uh, Tennessee State, American Baptist, uh, and, but we really open it up to any and all students of color from any universities. Uh, and, and so we're continuing to grow those relationships, continuing to grow those pipelines and really trying to do more grassroots on their campuses to educate them about the opportunities. Uh, the toughest part, I feel like for us really is the timeline for us is in the fall. Like that's when we have to make contact so that we can get people lined up for the summer. And we're continuing to grow those relationships. So that I mean, that's. I've worked on uh, the nine initiatives since it was announced in October, or I'm sorry, in uh, December of 2021. And so it's just the beginning for us. This is something we're committed to long term, something we're going to continue to grow. And, and really because of, of the site that we stand on in Sulphur Dell and the neighborhood that we're in, we want to make sure we're really ingrained here. And, and, and you know, our presence is felt at those universities and people feel like, 
um, any and all in Nashville, really, if they want to get into the business of baseball, they want to start it here at home with us. Great. Yes, Very nice. What's happening here on June the 2nd? Oh, yeah. I did not touch on the Savannah Bananas. Uh, they are coming June 2nd and 3rd. Um, the games have been sold out for months and months and months, which is why I didn't put together a slide on it. Typically, that's the first question I get. Um, yeah, no, we're re really excited for uh, them to bring their, their roadshow of banana ball here to First Horizon Park on June 2nd and June 3rd. It's going to be a spectacle. Uh, if you follow them on social media, see just a piece of what they do. Uh, but we are excited to host them here. The, uh, they'll play the party animals. They don't play the sounds. The sounds will be on the road. Uh, but it should be two nights of, of big fun here at the ballpark. If the board wanted to come and inspect the stadium, would that, would that be? I mean, I think yeah, we'll have to get you. We'll have to get you. Uh, you know, a pass. <laughs> Great. Any other questions or comments? Not. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. Very thank you all. Much. So this concludes our agenda. I'd like to thank the members of the board, sports authority staff, Metro Legal and Finance, and our facility team representatives for your input today. We thank the National Sounds and First Horizon Park for hosting us. The next full board meeting is scheduled for Thursday, June 15th at Bridgestone Arena. We anticipate the finance and personnel committees will meet prior to the full board. Um, the personnel committee is comp comprised of our executive committee, our officers and typically one member who does not hold an office. And so the personnel committee will meet at least annually to review the performance of the executive director. We can meet at other times clearly, but we have to do a review annual review of our director. And as chair, I've asked uh, director Don Deering to serve on this committee at, for this year. So uh, thank you, Don, for agreeing to serve. And if there are no other questions or comments, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So your sales adjourned. Thank you. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again or for more information on this and other programs, visit Nashville.gov.